Welcome back to my channel. I'm Brian Kapke, and in this video, we're going to be walking through how to create SQL tables in Databricks. But before we jump in, please consider supporting me on Patreon. You get direct access to me among the benefits. We're going to start by talking about the AdventureWorks use case. Then we'll talk about the data that we'll be using in our project. And then we'll finally jump in and I'll show you how you can create your SQL tables easily with a Databricks notebook. Now the AdventureWorks project use case comes down to this. Management wants to get business insights from their data. They want to get a better understanding of sales and customer behavior related to sales. And ultimately they would like to create a machine learning model that will predict what a customer is likely to purchase. Now to do this, we're going to use the data science process, which I covered in a prior video. And I'll put a link in the description so you can go back to that if you'd like to view that. But in a nutshell, the data science process is just an overall structure, a set of steps, for going from the very beginning of a project to the end. And it starts with analysis. We identify the use case. We've just done that, so we're pretty good there. And then we need to identify the data required. That's taken care of because I'm going to show you the data we're using from AdventureWorks. AdventureWorks data comes from Microsoft's test data, which they allow for their own training. So we're just going to lift and shift with that. Uh, the next step would be data engineering, and that starts with data collection. So we need to identify in the analysis what data do we need, and data collection involves figuring out where that data is going to come from and how to get it into our project. As part of that, we're going to have to probably build some sort of an ETL process, upload into, in this case, our Databricks environment, and then we're going to have to do things like cleanse the data and prepare it for use. Then we go through a step which is called exploratory data analysis. This can be extremely beneficial because we're going to learn about things we may not have realized, like what are the demographics of our, our most profitable customers? What are the majority of our customers, say, ages? Do we know? Do we know is there a preference of among education levels of people, etc.? So these things can be really valuable just to know in general. So we're going to look at that as well, and that's part of the data engineering process. Finally, you get to feature engineering. When you want to train a model, a machine learning model, to do some sort of a prediction, you need features. Features are the input. They're the data that's used, historical data, that can be mapped to some sort of an outcome. So, for instance, we can see things like customer demographics, geography may affect what a customer is likely to purchase. So we're going to look at that. But the idea is you need to first learn about the data, and then you need to prepare the specific columns of data you're going to use for being used in models. And models have very specific requirements. You can't just throw anything at them. Raw data doesn't work. Steps you need to go through to prepare the columns to be used by a model. And when you get to the machine learning step, here's where you have the model training and evaluation, and finally, model deployment. Now, a quick thing I would like to point out is that this really is like a data science team typically involved. You'll have analysts involved in the first step and domain experts. The data engineering piece is really the heavy lifting of the data, the architecture of the data. It's a huge area in itself. And then you finally have the machine learning, which is something typically handled by a data scientist. A part of this, the data step collection through model deployment, is really iterative. Models become out of date. Remember, models are not like fixed applications where you just get the requirement, build the app, and you're done. Machine learning models are completely driven from data. And since the data is continuously changing, the customer demographics could change. The economic conditions can change. Even just the time of the year can make a difference on what the models would predict. So things have to keep changing. And so that model needs to keep going through this cycle and being retrained. And you have to keep reevaluating the model. Now, we're going to be using a set of data. There's two potential sources. There's the AdventureWorks transactional data, which is what drives the actual business operations. And then there's a data warehouse. Data warehouse is an extract and a restructuring of data to be used in reporting. So in this case, we can see what's called a star schema. And the star schema is showing us that at the center is our fact table, and then off of that are our dimensions. So a star schema is considered sort of the gold copy of how you should be building a warehouse. And the idea is that your fact table only holds metrics and pointers to the dimension tables. What are metrics? Metrics are actual quantitative things like the amount sold, price, the unit price, etc. can be part of those metrics. The dimensions are descriptive, so they're not meant to be quantitative. They're not the kinds of things you're going to be aggregating and things like that. So we have the sales territory, the product, the date. So we have a separation of descriptive data, dimensions, 
and the quantitative data fat. Now, bear in mind, there's only one level of joining required in this structure. A fact can join to any one of the dimensions, but dimensions do not join to other dimensions. If a dimension joins to another dimension, then it's called a snowflake. So don't get that confused with the popular data warehousing product snowflake. Snowflaking is actually not a good practice in dimensional modeling. The key thing about data warehouses that are dimensionally modeled is redundancy is good because having a lot of redundancy means that queries typically, if it's done according to dimensional modeling, the queries will run a lot faster. The data is great available. Not ideal for maintenance, but it's great for doing reporting. So looking at the star schema, almost a star schema that they give you with AdventureWorks, we can see fact internet sales at the center. Now there is a resale we sell our sales table as well. We're not going to get involved with that for this particular analysis. We're looking at internet sales and we're looking at the product table. So we've got dim product and dim product category and dim product subcategory. There's two things to note. One is that the dim product we can see is joining to three different tables. That's snowflaking and generally that would be a bad practice. And in fact, I would recommend a company merge that into one dimension. So it's not really well designed that way. But we can see things also, we have relationship to another fact table, which probably could be a dimension as well. And finally, we have our dim ta uh, dimension table. The main point is we have dimensions with the descriptive data and our fact, fact internet sales is really our core sales table, our fact table. I'm in Databricks now, I'm in my workspace. And if I'm, I'm using Azure Databricks. So I went into Azure, logged into the portal, went to the workspace and then just started it. And in the workspace, I clicked on clusters and my cluster is terminated, which means it's really paused and all I have to do is restart it. So let me restart it. It'll take a few minutes, but I'll cut out that time for you guys. So to start the cluster, um, I had to shrink the screen a little bit. Over to the right here, you can see this little arrow. All I have to do is click the arrow. It's going to say, confirm you want to start the cluster. And I said yes. And then I just have to wait a few minutes while it's starting the cluster. The cluster has been restarted. And the first thing I want to walk you through is how to get data up to a cluster. So I'm going to go to the toolbar on the left, click on data to the cluster. What we can see is we have a number of databases. Now we're going to be recreating a W project or like be using that one, but um, that's the one we'll create. But what you can see we have default and we have several other databases out here. Default is the one that you automatically have and you don't have to create any others. What I want to do here, and you can see there's all different tables, depending on which thing you pick, you can see the tables. So when we think of databases, we can see that a database is really kind of like a, a folder in which we're putting our tables. Now what I want to do is click on create table, and it doesn't really matter which database is clicked because we're not going to load it into a database, we're just going to bring files up. So I'm going to say create table. and down in the files box, you can see here, we're going to click on, we're down here, we're going to click on browse. And once we've done that, you can see there's a whole bunch of files here. Select all the files, then say open. What you'll see happen is all these files are being uploaded. Now this is something that's not obvious when you use Databricks at first, but you can upload a lot of files at once. And this is that something I've been asked a lot when I've done workshops. How do I do them all at once? You can see here, I'm bringing all these files up, doing a little bit of work. Some of these are fairly large files and I can see down here, they're all listed. Now the one common denominator I want you to pay attention to is that the folder they're going to is file store slash tables. So when we upload to the UI, the Databricks UI, it automatically goes to file store slash tables. And this is under the Databricks file system. So when you have Azure, an Azure Databricks workspace, it automatically attaches blob storage to it. And this is where the Databricks file system is kept. That's where it stores things. So we've uploaded all these files. Now, the only problem is I can't use the create table with the UI button because that only works on one file at a time. The other thing I want to point out is since I've done this before, you can see it just adds a sequence number onto the files. Like I've already got a dim currency, so it's going to call it dim currency dash two. You can see there's a lot of these things where it's already done that. All right, so now that we have our tables uploaded, I'm going to go to Create Tables. What I want to do here, let me just give it a little bit a little bigger for you. First thing I want to do is create a database if it doesn't exist. Now, we already saw I do already have it, but you guys won't. So I can hit Control key plus Enter, or I can go over here and just click the arrow and say Run Cell. 
And if this database didn't exist, now it does. Now I want all of the things I do when I say create tables and load things and do things, I want it to all take place in my new database. And I've called the database AW Project. So in order for that to happen, I'm going to do what's called change in the database context. So if I say use database name, it means everything after that is automatically going to assume that I want it to happen in that database. Now you can override that by prefixing something like a table with the database name. So some other database dot table name. But we're just going to go into the AW project database. And now what I want to do is I want to take those files we created and load them as tables. So first thing I need to do, I'm going to drop the file if it exists, drop the table if it exists. And so for instance, I have dim date. If it exists, I'm going to drop it. That way I can upload it again. This might be something too you would want to periodically run. Maybe you're going to get refreshed files and you want to delete what's there and just reload them. So that's an example you might do that. Using if exists is a good idea because if you just said drop table and the table didn't exist, it's going to give you an error. But if you say if exists, it will only try to drop it if the table's really there. Now I'm going to create a table. It's called dim date. And I'm going to say it's a CSV file using CSV. And the options are doing things like telling it where is this file. Now I had a problem because the syntax seemed to have changed what they allowed. It used to be I didn't need the slash. But now if I don't include the leading slash, it gives me an error about absolute path must be required is required so you make sure you include that but this is where it uploaded the dim date file that we just you know brought all those files up that's where it went so that's right there we're going to say header equals true by including the header equal true option it says that the first row in the csv file includes the column names so each thing and what that means is we can use those column names as our table column name so we don't have to provide it so that's what's going on there in first schema equal true means that as it's loading the data uh, spark is going to analyze the data and determine what the data types are whether it's a string or it's numeric or etc okay so i'm going to just run this here you can see i reran it earlier okay and lo and behold you can see that the data came up fine all right, so let's do another one. And we're just going to go through a bunch of these. Now we have dim customer, and it's really the same idea. We brought that file up. There it is. The header is true, so it's going to use the first row, of, which has the column headings, as column names. And it's going to figure out what the data types are for us. And then we're just going to display a couple of rows to make sure it worked. I'm using Control Enter on the cell to run the cell but not advance. If I press Shift Enter, it would run the cell and go to the next cell but i want to take a look at things before i move on and we can scroll in here and see there's quite a few columns in that particular thing that's the customer information now we're going to do geography the dim geography table again there's really nothing different about each one of these so we're going to run that dim product same thing so it's pretty straightforward doing it this way is is actually nice because you can load up a bunch of tables and then just write a bunch of statements like this and boom, we're done. Okay. And dim sales reason. So we're getting a bunch of tables. The idea is we're going to build up a set of tables in a database. So now we can slice and dice and join and do a lot of analysis on the data. This one's dim sales territory, so it provides territory information. All right, good. And fact internet sales. This is the big one. This is a fact table. It shows all the sales information, so we definitely need that. One of our larger tables. Uh, we can see quite a few columns in here. Now, this particular load, I want to show you, and it's a little bit different. We're going to be loading a table called Fact Internet Sales Reason. It's a small table. We're going to do a couple of things different because I just want to show you that you have some options here. And one of them is you may have noticed like, okay, it's great, but what if I don't have um, a row which gives me the column headings? What if I don't want to do that? So one thing I can do is instead of that, instead of just taking the first row for column headings, I can actually tell it the schema 
right here. So I'm saying there's a sales order number, which is a string, sales order line number, which is an int, and a sales reason key, which is an int. And I'll put a link in the description so you can find what are all the different data types recognized by Spark SQL, uh, because they're not exactly what you might be used to in a relational database. So that's going to define the schema. Now, in order for that to work, I need to tell it that the header is false, meaning don't read the header row to determine this information. The other thing is I'm telling it the types, right? So I don't want it to infer the schema either. So I've got those two things. So the big takeaway, just to review this, is I'm turning off the header and infer schema options, and I'm giving it the schema here. Now, I'm going to make sure everything lines up. If I have too many columns or too few, I'm going to have problems. But let's see how this goes. All right, so this looks good. We can see that we now have our columns, that we gave it the names, and all looks good. We've got our data types. So I think we're good to go on that one. One of the things we may want to do is take a look at the tables and just see some of their attributes. So let's confirm, for instance, that we actually got the data types we wanted. Run this, and we can see that uh, we can see that, yep, it defined it correctly. Remember, we didn't, we said in first schema is false, so we told it the schema and it worked. And we can see a couple of, a lot of other information because we used the extended option. Now let's do a list of the tables to make sure we got everything. And if I do show tables, you can see we got all our tables here. So this is really a nice handy way to do things. In summary, we first created the database, which you can think of more as a folder. We then you did the use statement to switch context into that folder. And then we took all those files we uploaded and we defined them as tables. We started by talking about the AdventureWorks use case and the idea that management called us into the office and said, we want you to do this project, which is a fairly typical scenario. As a consultant, this is the usually how I start something, maybe not always a machine learning use case, but usually some sort of a data analytic project. And the AdventureWorks use case is great because it gives us some pretty realistic data to work with, and we get to center all of what we're doing around the actual framework, it, which is used by professionals, the data science process. So you'll get to a good feel for how would you really approach a project and what are the steps you'd go through. And you can go back to these notebooks and to these slides and say, this is what I need to do which is really why I want to center it around a real project. We looked at the data itself, and we talked about the fact that there are transactional designs for databases, and then there's data warehousing. Data warehousing tends to have a lot of redundancy, and it's built usually by extracting data from a, an online transactional processing, OLTP database, uh, and it uses dimensional modeling, which is um, optimized towards querying and reporting. The transactional databases, OLTP, which is where most of the DBAs spend all their time trying to performance tune and make it hum, those are your critical systems that run your companies. Those are the things where people lose sleep if, if they go down. And so they have to run really quickly. So the architecture of those is very different. And the reason I want to point that out is because in your work, you're going to come across both in addition to things like flat files and uh, JSON files and any number of other things and NoSQL databases. So you have to be prepared for a lot of different things. We're going to be using mostly the data warehousing model data from AdventureWorks. Finally, we did a nice step through of a Databricks notebook in which we loaded, first we stepped through starting our cluster, then we uploaded all the data. We saw that we could just upload a bunch of files and Databricks automatically puts it into a folder for us and then we can just go and then in the notebook define each table from that data. So we're putting a schema on top, schema on read, which is something I talked about in another discussion of the lesson. So we can just now query using SQL, but we don't have to reload the data, right? We're actually querying it right where it is in those CSV files. So it's a really handy feature. All right, so that's really the gist of this. Covered a lot. So hope you like this video. Subscribe, tell your friends, let everyone know, put comments in. I love to hear comments, questions, etc. Until next time, we're all in this together. I'm pulling for you.